It was July 1991 when wife and I first came to Eastgate to be the official pastors of this great church. In preparation for our first service, I asked Joanne if she would sing that song for us back in 91. She did, just like she did this morning. There was a purpose behind that, for I just believed from what I'd heard before I became pastor that Eastgate was on holy ground. Amen? My prayer was that when we took over the pastors of this church that it would still be holy ground. Well, across these many years, I'm thankful to tell you we are still on holy ground. Amen? And this morning, this morning, we have every right to believe it in our hearts and to claim the victory. Eastgate is a holy place on holy ground. Say amen. Amen. But let me remind you of something. A holy God requires holy people to live holy lives to go to a holy heaven. Amen. Amen. So with that in mind, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Gospel of John, chapter 17. It's just so good for wife and I to be back home with you. Thank you for your prayers. Gospel of John, chapter 17. We have a unique privilege this morning of listening in to an intimate conversation of prayer between Jesus and his heavenly Father. This is the intercessory prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ as he touches the heart of his Father. Now, I know when we hear that prayer in Matthew quoted, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We always say that's the Lord's Prayer. That is not the original Lord's Prayer. That was the model prayer that Jesus used to teach his disciples how to pray. This is the intercessory prayer of our Lord Jesus. And what a privilege it is to listen to his heartbeat as he prays this prayer. Now, there's a couple of things we need to find out before we go any further. Number one, to whom was Jesus praying for in this prayer? What was the purpose of this prayer? Who was he praying for? And in verse 9 of this chapter, chapter 6, 17, Gospel of John, Jesus says, I do not pray for the world. Now, that sounds a little odd for Jesus to be saying, I'm not praying for the world. I'm not praying for the ungodly in this prayer. For we know that Jesus came into the world to die on the cross for the sins of all men. Am I right? But Jesus said, I'm not praying for the world. Not now. But I'm praying for those that have come out of the world, those that you have called out of the world to serve me. These are my disciples. These are my believers. They are the redeemed. These are those that are faithful. These are those who are true. These are those that are obedient to me. I'm praying for my children for my disciples that have come out of the world. But then he made this statement, I not only pray for these that you've given me now, I pray for those that will come in the future to me, those who will be redeemed and come out of the world and be saved and follow me and live for me and dedicate themselves to me and be, be spiritually filled and be obedient. I pray for them. So I want to encourage you this morning. If you're a child of God, if you know that your sins are forgiven, cheer up. You and I were included in this prayer of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that great? Say amen. amen. Jesus prayed for us as he prayed this intercessory prayer to his heavenly Father. Now, we need to know why did he pray this prayer. We know who he prayed for, but why did he pray this prayer? And in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, the world has hated me. And because the world hates me, the world will hate those that follow after me. They will be despised and rejected. There would not be a, they, the world would not be a friendly place for them to live. But Jesus said, I pray for them. They're not of the world, they're in the world. But I pray that you'll not take them out of the world, but that you will fill them with your spirit, protect them, and keep them from evil and the evil one. That was the prayer of Jesus. That was the purpose of this prayer. It would, be, it would be a great life if you and I come to Jesus and immediately go to heaven. Wouldn't that be great? Not have to deal with the devil and the sinful world in which we live. Just come to an altar, give our heart to the Lord, and be ushered on into glory. Wouldn't that be, a, wouldn't that be something? But that's not the way Jesus does it. I remember Dr. John Maxwell, a great church uh, growth expert, 
when he said the only way some people will ever get to heaven is to bring them to the altar, pray them through, and then shoot them. <laughs> now, you won't get to heaven, but they just might. But that's not Jesus' way. Jesus said, Jesus said, I want those that have come out of the world, your disciples, my disciples that have followed me, I want you to keep them from evil and from the evil one. What a prayer. The prayer of Jesus to his heavenly Father. Now, the climax of this prayer is found in verse 17 of chapter 17. And you'll read in, in verse 16 and 17, Jesus said, I have sanctified myself. I have set myself apart for my Father's glory. Everything I do, I do for Him. It is because of Him that I am who I am. And Jesus said, I have cleansed myself. I have kept myself clean from the world. And now I pray that you would sanctify my believers. Sanctify my believers. And I want to spend the next few moments just talking about a simple subject. What is the sanctified life? Jesus said, sanctify my believers. Sanctify them. Now, this prayer of Jesus prayed in John 17 was answered on the day of Pentecost. And so, therefore, I'll ask you to turn to Acts chapter 2, if you would, and follow along for the next few moments as we glean from this great chapter from the experience of Pentecost. Jesus did his very best before that day to prepare his disciples. He told them in, in an upper room, he said to them, it is expedient that I go away. I'm going to leave you. I'm not always going to be with you. I'm not going to be walking with you as I have for these last few years or serving with you. I'm going to be taken out of your sight. But he said, I will not leave you alone. I will send unto you another comforter. And the comforter that I send to you will not only live with you as I've lived with you, but will come to live within you and will bear witness to you that you're children of God. What a promise. And now you remember following the resurrection experience when Jesus came out of that tomb. Forty days he walked among his disciples. They were behind closed doors. They were fearful for their life. And Jesus met them and brought new hope and peace and joy into their life once again. But finally, at the close of 40 days, he met with his disciples at the foot of Mount Olivet. And he said to them, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. I've got to leave you. And sure enough, he did and ascended to the right hand of God the Father. But before he left them, he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and tarry in that upper room until you receive power. And then you'll be able to take my gospel everywhere out into the world and win people unto me. That was the gospel truth. Now, all of a sudden, these disciples, they didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what was awaiting them in that upper room. But out of obedience to their Lord, they made their way to Jerusalem. And there behind closed doors, and I'm glad that the Bible numbers it, 120 believers met for 10 days. You got it? 120 believers met in that upper room for 10 days. They didn't know what they were there for, except Jesus said, you're going to receive power. I'm going to pour out upon you power and glory. And so they waited patiently. They did everything they knew what to do. They did everything in their power to make it right. And finally, at the close of 10 days, when every preparation had been made and their hearts were perfectly in tune to their Lord, all of a sudden, heavens opened and God sent the blessed Holy Spirit into that room to fill every waiting heart. Not a person missed the blessing. And God came in a mighty way and the third person of the Godhead descended and made his presence known in the lives of those believers. I say praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, there were three things, three things that God used that day to usher in the Holy Spirit and into the hearts of those believers. Number one, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. Not the wind itself, the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And then there was the forked tongues of fire that fell upon those believers. And then there was the language, 15 different languages that were spoken that day so that everybody could understand it in their own nationality, in their own language. It was an amazing thing. It was quite an occurrence of power. And as those people stood by watching all of this, you know what they said? What does this mean? 
What does this mean? This filling of the Holy Spirit, this outpouring of glory, this power that has come upon these believers, what does it mean? And the question for us this morning is this, what does it mean? What does this sanctified life really mean? What does it mean to live holy and pure in the presence of God? Well, I think the Bible has an answer for that. There are three things. On the back of your bulletin, you'll see some notes. There are three things for you to fill in, three things I want to draw to your attention about the sanctified life. Very simple. Number one, the sanctified life is always Christ-centered. Say amen. amen. Always Christ-centered. The occurrence of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it was not a spirit event, and we do not discount anything that the Holy Spirit did that day for He came in power. It was a Jesus experience. It was Jesus who sent the Holy Spirit into that room. It was Jesus who paved the way for those disciples to be there. It was Jesus who came to live in the hearts of those believers. It was Jesus who found those disciples at the seashore and brought them into the kingdom. It was all about Jesus. When John the Baptist came out of the wilderness, you know what he preached? Here he comes. The Lamb of God that what? Takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus in that upper room said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. It was all about Jesus. It was Jesus who came into the world. It was Jesus that God sent to the cross. It was Jesus who died on the old rugged cross. It was Jesus who shed his blood. It was Jesus who paid the penalty for you and I. It was Jesus who saved us by faith. It was Jesus that was buried in the borrowed tomb. But it was Jesus who came alive on the third day to be the resurrected Christ. And he's alive and well this morning. Say amen. 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 It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Lord of our life. And when we come to the place following our, our salvation experience, what a great experience. But we come to the place by same childlike faith that we kneel before the Lord and we just bow there and give everything to God. We just put up our hands and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all. I just give everything to you. All that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to be, all that you want me to be, I just give it all to you. I say, praise the Lord. What a way to live. And we surrender everything to the Lordship of Jesus. You see, in the sanctified life, it simply means that Jesus becomes the center, the center of everything we do. Isn't that amazing? We don't speak a word without Him. We don't perform an act without Him. We don't take a step without Him. We don't make a decision without Him. It's Jesus, Lord of our life supreme because we have surrendered everything to Him. Say amen. What an experience it is to come to the place in life when you just throw up your hands and say, okay, Lord, I give it all. There's nothing held back. I don't want to, I don't want to hold on to a thing. It's all yours. And we surrender everything to allow Him to be Lord of our heart and Lord of our life. I say glory to God. Amen. And we do not want to do anything that would embarrass Him as Lord. The sanctified life is Christ-centered. The second thing that I notice about the sanctified life is that it is a power event. It's a powerful thing. And on the day of Pentecost, recorded there in Acts chapter 2, you've read it, you're reading it right now. All of a sudden there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind that flooded that place. Now those disciples were familiar with wind. They had faced it many times out on the sea in that little boat. They knew what it was all about. But now there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. You and I here lately, especially this year, seem like more, than, more so than others, we've seen and heard the effect of the wind, am I right? As it's blown across this nation and across our world and it just destroys everything in its past. It's powerful. It's strong. Uh, nothing stands up under its force. Uh, and we've seen that happen recently around us. The power, the power of the wind. And God used the sound of a rushing mighty wind that flooded that place. It must have been a remarkable experience to hear the wind blow. Not to see it, but to hear the wind blow. And I say to you this morning, the sanctified life is a life of power. 
Amen? It's a life of divine power that brings us to the place where everything not only is committed and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus, but there's power that's placed within us to be what God wants us to be and to live the holy life and to live above sin and to live in victory and to enjoy our relationship to Jesus Christ. I say praise the Lord. You remember those disciples? I don't have to take too long to describe them to you. Before the day of Pentecost, they were spiritual weaklings. That's not a put down. That's just scriptural. Amen. They were spiritual weaklings. Oh, Jesus had called them from different areas of life to follow them, him, and they did. But they were weak. They were weak. They were always questioning the Lord about something. <laughs> and they were always debating among themselves. They were always fighting and fuming and arguing among themselves. And who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Now, we don't have that around our church, but those disciples did. Amen? They did. Even at the upper room around the table, you know what they were doing? They were debating and arguing among themselves. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Isn't that something? They were weak. Weak. One sold Jesus out. One denied him three times. And they all went behind closed doors for fear of their life. But Jesus loved them. But after Pentecost, something happened. These spiritual weaklings that came into that room that day and tarried for ten days, they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And they left that place, not spiritual weaklings, but spiritual dominoes for Jesus' sake, to go out into the world and turn it upside down for Jesus. Amen? Amen. And you know what the world said about them? We can't stop them. <laughs> They're unstoppable. There's not a thing we can do to even quiet them. They won't quit. They won't give up. And they changed the course of history. They changed the course of the world because they were filled with the power, the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit that enabled them to leave that room with boldness uh, to, live, to live for Jesus. I say praise the Lord. There's power in the sanctified life. There's power in the sanctified life. Power to live above sin. Power to say no to the evil. Remember Jesus had just prayed, I don't pray you take them out of the world, but I pray that you will keep them and surround them and love through them and, and keep them from the evil one and from evil itself protect them. And there's power to do just that. There's power in the sanctified life. Well, the third thing, very quickly, the sanctified life is a life of cleanliness. Cleanliness. There's something about the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit that comes in when we're sanctified holy. Amen. The old sin that we are inherited from Adam is now destroyed, and the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit comes to take charge of our life, just cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. The Bible says that there were forked tongues of fire. Now, I don't understand this. It's hard for me to visualize, but... There was forked tongues of fire that hovered over every believer, 120 of them. And then at just the right moment that the, the forked tongues of fire fell into the hearts and lives of every one of those believers. Now, I can't explain that. I don't need to explain that. The Bible explains that. And I believe it, don't you? The power of the Holy Spirit. But they were cleansed. They were cleansed. Their hearts were cleansed by faith. They became new creatures in Christ Jesus. They not only had to de they, they not no longer had to deal with a lot of the frustrations uh, and, and the things that they'd lived with before, but now they were clean. Uh, they were clean, and they could serve the Lord uh, with boldness and gladness. I've had, uh, in my almost 50 years of ministry, I've had people to say to me, Well, Pastor, you just have to accept me for who I am. You ever hear that? You just have to accept me for who I am. I just am who I am. <laughs> you, you have to understand my heritage and where I've come from and how I was raised and, and how, how I was taught in school and all of this stuff. I'm, you, I just am who I am. Well, I want to tell you something, folks. You might be who you are, but you don't have to stay like that. The cleansing power of the Holy Spirit can cleanse us. I've had people, Pastor Shannon, you've been there, you know about it. 
I've had people to say, Pastor, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't live the holy life. I can't live the sanctified life. I just can't do it. Yes, you can. I can't be clean. Yes, you can. I can't be faithful to God. Yes, you can. I can't give up my habits. Yes, you can. I can't give up my addictions. Yes, you can. I can't give up my illicit relationships in life. Yes, you can. I can't be faithful to read my Bible. Oh, yes, you can. I can't be faithful to pray. I can't be faithful to come to church regularly. I can't be faithful to pay my tithe. Oh, yes, you can. Huh? Yes, you can. But not on your own power. You see, you and I are not strong enough or bold enough, and we do not have the strength to stand up against the forces of evil. And the old devil is always roaming around, seeing who he may devour. But sin is greater than we are, and you and I are no match for sin. And the problem is that we try to take care of these situations on our own. We try to give up these habits and desires and, 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 and addictions on our own, but we're not strong enough to do it. And so therefore we see people, they come and go to a place of altar. Thank God they do. And thank God for every prayer they pray. But they get up from the altar and go right on back to their addictions and their habits and the relationships. But I want to tell you something this morning. There's power. There's cleansing power. You can't do it on your own, but the good news, the good news is that with the power of the Holy Spirit invested in you, living within you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. Sure, you can give those things up. Sure, you can walk away from it with boldness. Sure, you can leave him behind you uh, with clarity. Sure, you can get on living your life for Jesus. But it takes the power and the cleanliness of the Holy Spirit in our life to do it. You cannot do it alone. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. And we can be more than conquerors through him that loved us and died for us and gave himself for us. I say, praise the Lord. That's good news. That's good news, am I right? Amen. That's good news this morning. That we can be saved, not only be saved from sin, but we can be delivered from the sin practice in our life and from the old carnal nature and be set free to be divine children of our Heavenly Father. I say glory to God. Praise the Lord. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to others around us? Jesus said, you're going to receive power. And when you receive that power, then I'll send you into the world. And you'll preach my gospel and win people for my sake. There's the answer. What does it mean? I have a, let me share with you a couple of things. In my prayer time every morning, has been now for over three years. About five o'clock in the morning, the Holy Spirit wakes me up. And, and uh, I find myself in my quiet time alone with the Lord for at least one hour. It's an amazing thing. I would advise it. I would recommend it highly. Before you get into the world's affairs, get along with Jesus. But three things I do. I don't want it to just be a ritual, but three things every morning that help me. Number one, the first thing I say, I don't know why I say it. I just say, hello, Jesus. Now, he knows I'm there. <laughs> he woke me up, right? I just say, hello, Jesus. It's me. It's me, and I thank you for waking me up to this day. That's amazing to wake up to a new day, isn't it? Amen. Just wake up in the presence of the Lord. And then I say to him, Lord Jesus, this is the day that I've committed to you. I commit this day to you. Here we are in the bright early morning hours. I don't know what the day's going to hold. I don't know where you're going to lead me. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to come to me. I don't know about the decisions that I'm about to make this day, but I commit this day to you. It's yours because I'm yours and you're Lord of my life. Amen. And then the third thing I say is this. Lord Jesus, here I am. Here I am, your servant, your servant. And Lord Jesus, here I am, unblemished this morning. Not perfect. But here I come into your presence unblemished. I come this morning into your presence clean. I come into your presence, Lord, expecting you to bless me today. Unblemished. Unblemished because you're Lord. And here's my prayer. Lord Jesus, help me to live this day 
every moment of this day for your glory so that when I come back at the close of the day and lay my head down upon the pillar, I can say, Lord Jesus, here it is, unblemished. Unblemished. It is yours because you've walked with me and talked with me throughout this day. I say, praise the Lord. What a way to live. Sanctifying presence of God. Let me share with you a personal experience, and then we'll close, all right? I remember my sanctifying experience. I really do. Many, many, many years ago, uh, I was about, oh, maybe 21 years of age, give or take a little bit. I'm not exactly sure, but wife and I, after we were married, we were prayed into the Pilgrim Holiness Church. Some of you are familiar with that, that church. And we were actually prayed by a faithful pastor and wife into that church, no doubt. Oh, what a relationship we had. They adopted us into the family, just like we saw this morning. And they loved us. And oh, he was my mentor for five years. And I learned more under him than I have in perhaps all the books that I've read since. What a pastor. But we were prayed into the Pilgrim Holiness Church, 19th Street, Emmanuel Pilgrim Holiness Church, 19th Street, Northwest Roanoke. It was an old building. Nice but old. The parson sat right behind the church. Wasn't much to look at until you walked into the doors. And as soon as you walked into the doors of that church, you recognized that you were on holy ground. God was there, filling that place with glory, touching the lives of people, people getting saved, just like here in our beloved church, people getting saved and sanctified every week. The glory of God was upon that place. Now here I am, a new convert. Here I am, freshly married. Here I am. I, I wasn't raised in a church that believed in holiness or knew anything about sanctification. Prayed into that church. But oh, what an effect it had on my life. My wife played the piano. I was in charge of worship. Led the singing, sung some songs, led the choir, this sort of thing, five years. But the thing that impressed me most of all from the very first day we walked into the church was those saints of God that were genuinely filled with the Spirit. You didn't have to build it up. God was there. As soon as I walked into the doors of that Pilgrim Holiness Church, my heart was touched. I mean, it was just overwhelming with His, overwhelmed with his presence and glory in that place. And the saints of God, oh, the saints of God that were filled with the Spirit. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. Now, I've, I've been places since then where I've experienced the same Spirit. In fact, I delight in reporting to you, I believe the same Spirit is upon our church this morning. Amen? I believe that. But oh, oh, what an experience. Those precious saints. Wow. <laughs> and they adopted us. We were just youngsters. <laughs> wow, it seemed like a long time ago. Well, it was a long time ago. And they adopted us. They, they loved upon us and prayed for us. And, oh, they supported us. And, oh, they were just so kind. And what, what an experience. What an experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But I remember those dear old saints demonstrating their love for Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit that was on them. It was genuine. You didn't have to sing 52 verses, of course, to wake them up. <laughs> You know, they just, they were alive. They were just alive, okay? And I remember them. And that was the day of testimonies, Pastor Shannon, a day when they were not ashamed, when the Holy Spirit would so fill their hearts and overflow their cup, they just jumped to their feet with a spontaneous praise of glory and victory in their life, telling what Jesus meant to them and how he had changed them and what was going on in their life. It was miraculous. It was a beautiful experience. Now, we don't do that a whole lot now. Perhaps we should, but we're a little quieter than we were those days. That's all right. And then I remember those old saints, they'd get blessed. They'd get blessed, and they, they didn't know how to contain themselves. And some of you grew up in that environment. You know what I'm talking about. And ever so often, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, somebody would get their hand up in there like that. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Huh? Isn't that something? And then they really get blessed, and somebody get both hands up in the air. Pastor George, that's Pentecostal. That's all right. It's okay. And they begin to praise the Lord and wave their hands towards heaven, giving God the glory. Pa 
Brother Barry, you remember those days. Oh, what a sight it was to watch those saints. And I was caught up in that as a young convert. I knew I was saved, and it touched my heart. And then I remember they would break out in applause for Jesus' sake to give Him the glory and honor because they loved Him so much. It was a precious thing to see. And you know something? I think right here at Eastgate right now, it would be good if we just give the Lord a good handshake to say, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. You're Lord of our life. You're supreme. You mean all in all to me, to us. It's you. It's you. We surrender everything to you. Oh, we give God the glory. I say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And then I remember... I remember some of those saints. Now, our young people, some of you youngsters and young adults are not going to know a thing of what I'm talking about, but that's all right. It's okay. It was a good thing. I'm not saying we need to go back and repeat it, although I confess to you I miss it a little bit. But I see those precious saints. They reach into their pockets and get out a little white hanky like that, and they begin to wave it for the glory of God. Janet, you've been there. That's exactly what you're doing now, just giving God the praise. I remember, and I'm going to take time to share this. I wasn't, but it comes to my mind. In our first church at Grandview Heights, Brother Albert Wilson, <laughs> oh my, an older man of our church, loved the Lord, lived by himself. So, you know, his hankies weren't as clean as what they should be, you know. <laughs> you get the picture? But oh, he loved the Lord. He sat in the back of our sanctuary that we built there at Grandview Heights, and sat on the corner seat. And I remember him on several occasions. It didn't happen every service. didn't have to. But on the anointing of the Holy Spirit, when God would just fall upon that place, and the glory of God took charge, and I couldn't preach, and they had to stop singing. And, oh, it was amazing what God was doing. I can see Brother Albert as he got up from that seat, that pew back there, and came down the center aisle right here. He didn't say a word. Here he was now, shabby clothes, Clean but shabby, loved the Lord with all of his heart, his cup full and running over. He didn't know how to express himself. And here he came down the center aisle. I can still visualize it. I can still hear it. Oh. Hip, 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 hip. And he came down to the front of to the sanctuary, turned around to the altar, looked at me, had a big smile on his face, went back up the aisle. Hip. And sit down. Woo, you're talking about the glory of God in that place? Huh? <laughs> that was the old days. That was the good old days. And these are good days to serve the Lord. And I remember those saints, they didn't know how to express it, so they'd get up out of their seats and their little hankies waving in the air. And you know what they did next? What did they do next, Janet? Around, <laughs> Paul's got it, around the aisle, they would go, around the church they would go, sometimes marching, sometimes running, praising the Lord, shouting the glory of God. They were just so overwhelmed with the presence of God. I told you you didn't know anything about it. Praise the Lord, Janet, you do it. Don't ever quench the Spirit. But it was genuine, it was real, it was sincere. And oh, it touched my heart. And I'll never forget that Sunday morning, I just finished, I don't know, maybe singing a special. My wife had finished playing the piano. We came and sat down here. I think it was about the third row back in that sanctuary. And uh, I just got comfortable. And the pastor got up to preach, and he was preaching about the sanctified life. <laughs> he didn't get very far. He didn't get very far. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Son, you need to be sanctified. You need the experience of holiness. You need the power, the cleansing power, and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's the only way you're going to make it. You're not going to survive without it. You need it. And I remember getting up from that chair right here and coming down to the altar of prayer and kneeling over here on, on my left, your right, at the corner of the altar. And oh my, those old saints, those precious saints, my pastor was there. Those old saints that loved us and adopted us came down, gathered around us. And I understand that there were those that prayed all the way across the altar, and two of our best friends were saved that morning at the altar of prayer because of the service. I say glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. And there I was at the altar. I was praying. I was praying. I was seeking. I was seeking the work of holiness. I knew I needed to be sanctified. 
I'd seen something in the lives of those believers that touched my heart. It was real. It was genuine. And I was praying as hard as I could. And those old saints gathered around me that Sunday morning and began to beat me on the head and beat me on the shoulder. I thought they were going to kill me. I literally thought they were going to, well, not really, but it felt like you know, they were sincere. They wanted their youngster, they wanted their adopted son to be sanctified, holy, Barry. And they get, and begin, oh, my, they were serious. It wasn't this sissy stuff today like, do you feel better, honey? <laughs> they didn't want me to feel better. They wanted me to pray through. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And, oh, they begin to pray. And I heard them as they cried out to the Lord. Come on, son, give up. Oh, you could hear them. Give up, son, give up. Die out. Come on, son, die out. Die out. And they kept beating me on the head and the shoulder. I had to do it soon. Oh, <laughs> wasn't, going to think, wasn't going to be anything left of me. And then I heard them, come on, son, put the unknown bundle on the altar of prayer. Now, that's something you don't hear much around the church these days. But put the unknown bundle on the altar. You know what they were saying? Not only put your past, not only bring your present, but give God your future. Everything. Commit it. Let go of it. Surrender it unto Him and His will. Let Him take charge of it. Let Him take care of your ministry. Let Him take care of your life. He'll do it. He's a faithful God. Just die up. Give out. Put the unknown bundle on the altar. Well, I testify to you this morning, folks. <laughs> it happened. It happened. It happened. God came, the Holy Spirit poured out Himself that morning in all of His fullness, in all of His glory, in all of His power, and cleaned me up and gave me new directions, gave me a life that was worth living, full of power, gave me a life that was worthwhile, and a ministry, I never, just, I never thought in my lifetime that God would take me through the ministries that he has all through these years. Well, I want to tell you, I was approximately 21 years of age. I just had a birthday and I was, mm, I was 79 years old. And I testify to you this morning, it's worked all of these years. It's been real all of these years. Have there been times that I've failed the Lord? I have to say, sorry, Lord, yes. Have there been times I've had to ask forgiveness? Yes. Have there been times when I had to come back for a new infilling of the Holy Spirit? Yes, time after time. But I want to tell you, that Sunday morning when I said yes to Jesus, and Jesus said yes to me, and I committed my life, my all, unto Him and surrendered everything, it's been good all of these years, and it's still good this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. It works. And Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And that prayer was answered on the day of Pentecost. And those disciples became new creatures in Christ Jesus. It works.